listening to the SEL in Action podcast, the podcast where we explore what social and emotional learning looks like in educational and professional settings. I'm your host, Heather Woods, and today on episode three, we will be speaking with Professor Marie-Hélène Brunet about what social and emotional competencies are required in a higher education. This episode is part of the Social and Emotional Competencies in Distance Leadership series. So today I am speaking with Marie-Hélène Brunet um, about her perspectives on the role of social and emotional competencies in leadership and education um, at a distance. And so Marie-Hélène is an assistant professor here at the Faculty of Education at the University of Ottawa, and she focuses on supporting teachers in teaching history and navigating uh, questions around gender, race, equity, um, class, and language. So, merci Marie-Hélène pour prendre du temps aujourd'hui pour parler avec moi. Um, yes, merci de l'invitation. <laughs> thank you a um, lot for having me over. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we've been kind of communicating by email just about kind of what's under this umbrella of social emotional competencies yeah. um, and the skills within it. So. Um, there's kind of a lot of skills within social self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, um, relationship building skills, and decision-making competencies. <clears throat> so I'm wondering which skills you see as the most essential for educators when teaching at a distance. When I received your email, I'm like, this is all really important. I don't know if I'm good at at, at putting all of this in, in my syllabus or in my course. Um, I think I might be doing a, a lot of that relationship building, mm -hmm. um, the social awareness, and I would think the, the self-management. The two other ones are, are, are also important, but maybe I would need to have a, um, I don't know, to, 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 to meet with you <laughs> to discuss this <laughs> and see how you, because I felt like I was thinking, Am I really having them like really thinking that I, probably, <laughs> probably <laughs> that I'm doing it, but not like self-consciously on, on my side, like it mm -hmm. happened, but it, the, the three other ones that I just said are probably the ones where I can see in my syllabus and in the way I'm th teaching that I do, um, I do some of those uh, things that you are putting there. <laughs> <laughs> And so what does like, um, you mentioned like relationship building first there. So what does that look like um, either in your syllabus or like in your practices to kind of help you foster relationships with your students? Well, the, the relationship building is like I start, I would say even before the semester starts, I, I will send an email to every student and just say, hi, so I'm your professor and I would like to know a bit more about you and please uh, feel welcome and know the class hasn't started but if you have any uh, questions I am available and at the very first uh, and if there's like a, a, a text that they have to get uh, that they have a book a mandatory book all of this will be like known in advance so that they it's not a surprise, like once they arrive, okay, I need to get this book. I don't know where, like I have those pretty long emails <laughs> where I'm trying to put as much as information. Um, a challenge to do this before the, the, the class actually starts is that sometimes you have new students coming in during the first and second. And I, sometimes I saw in the third week that mm -hmm. like sometimes I feel like I've, <laughs> I've helped a lot the ones that were, you know, on my list at first and those ones are kind of coming in and I feel like they will always be um, uh, trying to catch the current. I don't know if, if that's an expression <laughs> in English, but kind of just like because I've done a lot of this um, at the first uh during the first week, it really depends if I'm on a uh, completely online asynchronous mm -hmm. or if I do have a synchronous. So I don't know if, if you were planning on talking about those two and the difference yeah. that you bring. Um, but let's say if I'm in a completely asynchronous, I will have a video uh, of me presenting myself and I will invite them to go on a forum and present themselves 
and I will guide them through questions saying, well, these are questions that you, if you, if you want to respond to them, you're, you're free to. And the forum is there, but if you don't want to participate, this is not like a mandatory thing. But generally in online classes, even when they were like, I had a class with 40 last year, and yeah. I would say like 32 or 33 of them did uh, participate. Uh, in mm -hmm. that forum and would reply to each other. So really, I think there's a need for them to kind of connect. Um, mm -hmm. And that if I had the list of questions, you had like, you have all sorts of students, right? You have the, the, the students that will respond, like, <laughs> yeah. what's my, what's my pronoun? This is my pronoun. What's this? Uh, and some other people who will just, you know, build their own narrative and, and include those questions or not just, Mm -hmm. at themselves in, in different ways and I thought this is always fun but you know having those questions maybe is helpful in the sense that it's not just well go on that forum and present yourself right mm -hmm. what is presenting myself so and but not putting it mandatory maybe helps so that you know if they they, they would they want to say something else they can mm -hmm. um, and if I'm in in synchronous I still keep that. I still keep that forum, but during the first um, the first class when we see each other, uh, I will ask them. And sometimes, if it's a larger group, they don't open their cameras, or even in the smaller groups for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and I don't want to like impose the camera. Sometimes I say, "Well, if you can put your camera on, or or your sound, or you know, if you feel comfortable doing it and presenting yourselves, and you know." most of them will all if not all of them will do it uh mm -hmm. think that presentation of just building that relationship but it shouldn't end there right so that's just the the first so you have to kind of sustain this which i find mm -hmm. is sometimes sometimes difficult and sometimes they have two or three uh often like in french graduate they will have two or three other online classes mm -hmm. where they also have to do that presentation and then they they probably feel like it's a it's redundant mm -hmm. but generally they they still you know like it um there's a point in the there's a lot of group activities if i'm in synchronous asynchronous i find i found this to be very difficult to have mm -hmm. group activities. If I'm synchronous on Adobe, I use the workshop. Like I, I've learned, and especially this semester, that if I talk for over a certain amount of time, you know, there's a point where there's no more reaction, and actually, there's people where I see the name, but if I ask a question or if I, <laughs> they, they're not there anymore, mm -hmm. so. I kind of have to think my classes so that there's activities where there's a relationship building uh, because of the nature of what I'm teaching that might um, that might include activities where emotions are at the center of it, right? If I mm -hmm. did an activity on, on, on social construction of gender, well, I know <laughs> this will, um, this will bring necessarily and we did one on privilege so it, it brings emotions in any it's just the, you know with what I'm teaching it just happens it brings mm -hmm. discomfort but that also needs to be and that might be in the the, the two other um you know, the social competencies, well, the, yeah, the competencies <laughs> thank you um but that also means work for me to be sure and I can't be completely sure once they are in their workshop because I do go from one workshop to the other, but it's the same thing in a classroom, right? If they're mm -hmm. working in groups, there's just as much as you can know of what's going on as, as much as you can, but that's, that's you know, that's part of, of teaching, but mm -hmm. um, having clear uh, expect, well, expectancies for the course for the class for how we handle discussions for how we work in groups or the role of each one so well, that still applies to an mm -hmm. online format when we're on synchronous adobe it sometimes needs to be reinforced uh but it still uh, has to be there but i think i lost what i was saying so we were with relationship 
uh, buildings. Yeah. So those activities, if they're done in um, regular, um, you know, each week. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a workshop every week so that they would need to connect. And I tried, uh, I used, and that's a question. I'm not sure if that's the, um, that's the best way or not. So I, I don't know if there's a best way, right? That's, that's often the case in education, right? Yeah. <laughs> Every week, because of the way Adobe works, uh, it was um, aléatoire. So what's that word in English? Uh, it would bring the, the students in, a, in different groups every week. Mm -hmm. So they would work with different people from, the, from the, the class every week, which I thought was pretty neat. Yeah, so it randomized <laughs> at the same, them. Yeah, but at the same time, if you're never uh, talking with the same people, then it might be a bit harder. Like, I always give the opportunity, even in an a online asynchronous or synchronous, to do their, their assignments in groups or individually. Um, I will always have a few groups. Um, I saw this time, like, uh, I had half, half of them did it in groups and half of them did it uh, generally, like, not half of them are doing it. So maybe mm -hmm. the fact that we had every week a synchronous activity might have helped building those relationships, but it might have just been the, the class and the people who knew each other from other classes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that's a, a bit what you're looking for, or if you have more specific yeah. questions. So you mentioned um, kind of at the start of the year, kind of having them introduce yourself. So what are some of the questions that you're asking them to kind of kickstart the year off and helping kind of get them to know each other a little bit better and for you to get to know them better? Uh, I'm always asking where they are in their um, academic uh, leur parcours académique, so their academic road. Their academic <laughs> journey, yeah. Journey, <laughs> road. Um, um, their experience, because at the MED level, I think we get such a diversity, right, from people who just yeah. left the B.Ed. and have no experience in class except for uh, for their, their practicum mm -hmm. to um, principals and head of schools who have like 25 years of experience yeah. and, and are doing the, the, the graduate courses. Uh, but this diversity for me is not, it can be a challenge, but it's a good challenge. It's not something that I feel is, is making, I think it's something that makes it even more interesting for all yeah. of them because they can uh, connect in very different ways, right? Like mm -hmm. now in my course for gender and education, I had people from the Feminist and Gender Institute, and I had people uh, who had never heard any kind of words <laughs> related to gender. So I had like I had to dif differentiate, differentiate, yeah, do some uh, differentiation in my course, uh, in my syllabus, and that I think. Could also end up in one of your competences, right? Um, just for them to be, that, may, that might be a bit in self-awareness, but maybe more in self-management, like knowing where I am and kind mm -hmm. of choosing the kind of assignments, uh, the extra readings, etc. cetera. Um, in function of, um, hold on, uh, what was I saying? Sorry about this. Yeah, no worries. No, you're, I think you're touching on like differentiation and stuff. And I think yeah. on your part as the educator, that's like a lot of reflection and decision making skills and kind of yeah. analyzing the situations of knowing your students, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's really, really interesting to, and I mean, I, I'm doing the same thing with my students because like you, I have students from the arts, I have students from the sciences, I have yeah. early teachers, I have seasoned principals, like, you know, I've med yeah. students and directors of medicine and, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
I think a, a really fun challenge to kind of try and find ways like the readings and try to find ways to make sure they're like I, I tend to group them based on their experience um, oh, in smaller groups too. yeah um, but then there's an open discussion where they can really they're all sharing their um, module activities so they can really kind of learn from each other and like now we're almost at the end of the course but a lot of them are commenting like oh now I'm understanding how this broadly applies like outside of my um, you know area and field and so like they're starting to see these connections about how it all kind of we're all on very similar journeys but different applications right <laughs> and sometimes sometimes it is a challenge for me like to think out of my own experience because mm -hmm. I was a teacher in high school I always think education as you know elementary high school it's it's hard for me like for the people coming from those help from from university from from museums from different education is is a big word right it's not yeah. school <laughs> but sometimes it, it is like I had to take a step back and say okay it's not only school right so yeah how do we get this outside of the it, it even it, for me as a history educator it's it's not even just school like it's classroom like my mm -hmm. mind is set up like it, what happens in the classroom the teacher the students in high school mm -hmm. history <laughs> so I kind of have to expand my my thinking so that I include everyone mm -hmm. um, but also that still that my expertise um, you know be of, of something of interest so I can still use it but I still have mm -hmm. to expand uh, so that I can you know go and, and touch different interests and even for me that's good <laughs> 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 brings me uh, uh, to think outside of my little box. Um, mm -hmm. I think for anything related to emotion, that, that also comes in, right? Because we're, we are professors, we have positionalities, we have, and, and it's sometimes it's hard to make that thinking that if we want to contribute to those competencies that you have. Mm -hmm. um, well, if I want to contribute to that, I have to think of my own competencies, which are not always so good. <laughs> related to the, so uh, if I want to be able to help my students, um, sometimes I have to think of my own emotions, teaching some specific topics or, 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 or teaching how to manage uh, how do I think of my own management, self-management yeah. skills, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So it brings another um, layer to it, I think. Yeah. But if, if, if we don't do that step to actually think of our own positionalities, our own, um, our own ways of doing things and how that might influence. And just the fact that we are the professor like I try to tend to have have this thinking where I want them to feel, and especially in that diversity that we were talking about, like you are all experts of different things. I'm not for a lot of topics. I, I'm I know way less than you, right? Mm -hmm. So I want us to feel like everyone has a, a cr contribution to make. Uh, but I can't forget that they still see me. And legitimately, right, they see me as the professor, as the one giving them marks, as the one, you know, mm -hmm. deciding how this course works, how this, so I can't just like be there and, 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 and so there's like a fine line on saying, uh, please contribute, please, uh, but in their mind, I will always be a professor, yeah. right? Um, I don't know if, if you're understanding what I'm saying. I'm like, no, I'm no, it, it makes sense because it, um, it feeds into that, like what you mentioned before um, with the social awareness, right? Like there's yeah. social awareness on our part um, as the professor, as seen as this expert, right? But then yeah. there's the social 
context that we're trying to create and make space for and make people feel safe. Um, yeah. And then there's like communicating that to our students. Um, so I think, yeah, it's like all that um, reflecting on our positionality in the social context and then trying to understand what they're experiencing in that social situation. So I think we can jump into that and kind of like, so what are you doing in um, understanding like social awareness maybe on your part, but also with the students and kind of trying to communicate the social context that you're trying to create? Um, this time, I think my last course on gender and education is the one where I have been thinking the most about it because before that for online courses I always had um, a part about in the syllabus about respecting la netiquette I don't know how you say this in English well, the, it's netiquette yeah netiquette okay yeah. netiquette <laughs> okay the <laughs> <That's laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so kind of explaining it also either when I'm uh because if I'm completely asynchronous I will record myself explaining the syllabus and mm -hmm. so, yes, it's in the syllabus, but they will also have my voice explaining a, a bit more. Um, in my synchronous class this time, I added something because of something of different things that happened before. Mm -hmm. So self-awareness of, of what has happened, especially in forums online. Yes. Um, and I can say that I had the privilege this time to have a very small group. So I took the decision to monitor the forum, the online mm -hmm. forum, um, which I had not done before and which had led to situations where it's uncomfortable for me, for the students, and mm -hmm. puts some students, some of the, class, some of the students in the class in, in, in not safe situations. Mm -hmm. I'm this is really a struggle for me because I feel no matter how much we talk about net etiquette um, and there's rules and I'm always you know explaining this is not uh, to censor yourself it's to think that you are in a community right that that what you say has an impact that you have to think of how this might be received to the other uh, the, mm -hmm. and I say if you were in a classroom right you would think uh, there's this expression tourner sa langue cette fois avant de parler like I don't know if that exists in English. Like, turn so, your your <laughs> your tongue seven times in your mouth before saying something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I use it as saying, well, you know, there's you know things I can ask like <laughs> before I'm writing something. Is is someone going to be hurt? And I do mm -hmm. I did do this um, when I wasn't monitoring, uh, but it still happened because it is you know. This, this, I want to create a safe classroom, but mm -hmm. I can't promise a safe classroom because we're humans with emotions and um, sometimes someone doesn't realize. I don't think, I, I haven't had any case where I think it was violent in a, in a, in a desired way, in a, like in a, in a conscious way, right? Yeah. The person was saying this didn't have the intention to hurt someone else, right? Yeah. Uh, but it still ended up probably doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyways, because of cases, and I could give you some, some, some examples, but um, I, I think you may imagine what, what that, when we talk yeah. about race, gender, it, it, it brings up. Uh, so this time I did monitor, and I did, during the synchronous online, I did take like, uh, I don't know how long it was, but I really took the time to explain to them, this is not, I'm not censoring. What mm -hmm. happens is if I read something and I feel like it might hurt someone in the class that, that maybe it's just phrased in a way that, it, you know, I don't feel like this is 
uh, something that that should be published well i'm gonna write to you <laughs> and i'm gonna explain it and we can have a chat and so to help you um uh better understand and and then you can change your your post and uh and it has and so it's not like I'm not censoring you because I still want your idea to be out there, but mm -hmm. there's ways of, of saying it or, or so. And then during that discussion, I said, do you have questions? Do you understand what that means? And, and please do not feel like I'm attacking you if I'm saying no, because I will never just like refuse your post mm -hmm. and not say anything, right? I will yeah. refuse your post and write to you privately. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 nobody will have seen that post or will have known that you had you know and it happened like it was a group of 12 and I had to use that only twice in the semester but still and it was hmm. it, it went super well like I I did have a chat with each person and they understood and and it was like no I had no like oh I now I understand why mm -hmm. this might sound um, so yeah, I think monitoring was a good um, option, but I'm really thinking how is that possible if I get a class with more than 20? Um, yeah. um, even because even with like teacher assistant, then you need to uh, probably putting that responsibility to a teacher assistant is not. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a big responsibility. And if, if I have this discussion at the first class or even in a, in a video in a asynchronous and I'm explaining why I'm monitoring the, the, the forum, um, but then it's the teacher assistant who, like it feels like there's a breach of, of uh, a, a breach confiance between yeah. me. Like, so yeah i haven't i don't know if i can sustain this um, mm -hmm. i don't know if there's researches on this because i'm not a, an expert yeah i don't like i wouldn't say that I, I am like an expert expert on um online learning and discussions and like what i have found in in the work that i've done with like um michelle and and megan and the faculty um, in kind of digital literacies and um, is that no matter what the research says, like it yeah. works sometimes and it doesn't work other times or like, right? Just any type of teaching, that's how it tends yeah. to go. That's um, research and education, right? It's, right. <laughs> it's great to read, then you try, then you love some of it, and then some of it doesn't apply. Yeah. Every, conte every context is so, so different, right? Yeah, exactly. But I think it's really interesting that you're providing these opportunities for students to engage in kind of their perspective taking and self reflection. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, maybe even if it were a larger class to let them sit on their post for like 24 hours or something. Yeah, right? that's good. I love that. Thank and you. Like, <laughs> yeah. So then you're setting up the groundwork at the start of the term and saying yeah. like, okay, I will approve your post within 24 hours, but like take that time to kind of think about what you're saying and think about the impact on others and how you're communicating. Um, yeah. Cause one of the things that we talk about in this course so much is, you know, you have to be so, aware and self-aware of how you're communicating yeah. right because if you're not doing a video all that body language i mean even yeah. in a video you don't see like how i'm standing or how i'm positioned you know is my body language open you don't see that i'm sitting cross-legged like <laughs> um you know like all that stuff especially if you're just doing it by email or discussion forum or you know if it's text-based all that's removed yeah. Um, and so we've talked about like the studies where like, you know, if somebody responds just like to a text message and just says K instead of okay or okay with an AY or like how that could be interpreted and like there's just a natural tendency for negative interpretation bias, right? <laughs> when it's text-based that like 
oh, maybe that I said it the wrong way and like, or they're mad at me or like we just, there's a natural tendency to go that way. And so like- I think that's why we're using so much emojis too. Yes. <laughs> okay, with like a, a happy face. Yeah. Seems suddenly like, okay. Right? Yeah. But okay. <laughs> yeah. But no, it feels, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So, I didn't know about that kind of research. I want to read it now. <laughs> yeah. So actually there's um, a few years ago, some people over at Carlton did um, a study, um, Mila Kingsbury and Rob Copeland. Um, so that's where I know the research from because I've worked with them. But uh, yeah, it's it's so interesting. So there's that level of like, you know, communication and maybe taking that time or providing space for them to take that time to yeah. reflect on, you know, the perspective taking, the understanding the social norms and expectations of the group. And, um, you know, and then that's also based on you being able to communicate <laughs> those yeah. things. Um, but I think yeah, for so... gender or some topics that the it's also there's so many unconscious beliefs, right? That mm -hmm. you grow, you know. Even when a woman is pregnant, right? She a, a, a lot of of people will just ask to get the sex of of mm -hmm. the baby before the baby's born. There's already expectations put on him or her or they will. Yeah. In that case, him or her, right? There's mm -hmm. already expectations and, and all our society is so based on we need someone. Okay, is it is it men? Is it women? And if it's not, if we can't put a tag, it generally makes people uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. just understanding that and how much it, it is from from the very moment we're born or even before, it's it is a very tough task. It, it is, it is, it is for me and, I, and I'm working these questions and I'm a feminist and sometimes it's, it, it, it still blows my mind how much uh, there's so much that is integrated unconsciously, right? Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, it explains how we see the world, how we understand the world, how we classify the world, but then it ends up during a course, it can have, uh, yeah, very emotional impacts. And if, if we are not able to analyze where those emotional responses come from, right? Mm -hmm. I think it was Megan Bowler. I don't know if, if you're... Uh, um, it sounds familiar. Yeah, she's at OISE, and she worked like the pedagogy of discomfort. And, and she mm -hmm. talked about those cherished beliefs, right? But to understand how you react to someone, whether it be like a resistance or rage because you've learned about oppression or it's like all those resistance or fear. Well, where does, or where does it come from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and making that step to understanding where it comes from is not easy. And I wouldn't, I, I will not pretend that I am there yet at bringing my students to be able like that first competency of um, of self-awareness self um, I'm still working on this and I think one of the reasons is, is myself uh, having difficulties to analyze myself so it's a work in progress but it the questions of emotion that's why when you wrote it like uh, on Twitter I wrote to you because it's it is so important for me. And even in history teaching, I've been uh, doing some research uh, with student teachers as to know, like, what are the topics you want to bring in the classroom? And what are the topics you don't want to bring? Or how will you bring like the, these difficult histories? What, what do you mm -hmm. do you think that you have a neutral position? And, and so all that question of emotion, specifically in the history classroom, has been of interest for me. So emotions more at large and in teaching and in online teaching, I think it's mm -hmm. always there. It's, um, I don't think as educators that we have reflected enough on the importance of emotions. I think I think it has, we want to rationalize things, even like um, critical pedagogies. What are they? Mm -hmm. 
they, they often dismiss emotions, right? Yeah. Um, so that's why like, anti-oppressive education starts to bring, but the, the word emotion is not there so much yet. So I think it's like the next step we need to take. And it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. I, 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 yeah, I don't pretend having like the good ways or I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying. My, my yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I think that is one of the important things as well is that like, as uh, like the leader in the course, the educator, um, you know, particularly I find um, because I'm teaching this stuff, like yeah. there's an assumption that we are like the expert, right? And like, no, we need to let them know that there is that wiggle room and like that vulnerability and being like, you know, I'm still working with this. Yeah. Right? Like I'm yeah. still reflecting. I'm still learning about myself and understanding, you know, what has influenced me and my position um, and how I'm like communicating and, you know, understanding my beliefs and, um, you know, because we use like Bronfenbrenner's um, bioecological systems thinking just to kind of start thinking about those external influences. So like, you know, how is culture influence what we believe? How is, you know, our parents, our family and like, but then the interactions between like our parents and school, you know, like those little things that have influenced us and like, you know, our access to, you know, health support, like how has that shaped who we are? Um, and you know, how we've learned these competencies, but also how they might um, be expressed, right? In like those settings. So like, you know, when you're discussing those difficult situations and feelings and stuff that, that you know, responding with like rage or responding with, you know, being upset or whatever emotions come out, I think it gives you that frame to kind of look at that, but then to also take the perspective hopefully um and it sounds like that's what you're trying to do with kind of moderating the conversation a little bit is providing that opportunity to be like oh like it's almost engaging in Nell Nodding's ethics of care where she's like you know it's not about how you would feel in the situation you need to understand how they like what context and what perspectives are they bringing um that would influence how they read what you're writing or that sort of thing um so yeah that's that's really awesome <laughs> well there there's something that i do when i'm i would say just the last two years when i'm teaching in in a nor well not, i'm not a normal classroom that no, i'm working <laughs> in real the norm but in, yeah <laughs> like you know the thing we haven't seen for months now <laughs> yeah <laughs> um uh but i say it like, I don't put it in my syllabus, but I will say it. And now I've added it for the first time in my syllabus for my gender and education. Uh, and I've also did it in my presentation. And it relates to what you were saying. It's like, I'm not perfect. I'm not an expert on everything. I'm also navigating uh, mm -hmm. gender because, you know, what I've been doing is one, one very small <laughs> expertise in that big field. Um, and even for that, I can, I can do mistakes. I can, and if at one point I say, or, or you read something, or there is something that disturbs you, please like, feel free <laughs> to call me on it, like, or mm -hmm. to write to me or have a discussion. And, and, you know, I, I, I'm still learning. So uh, hopefully this is, this is a way also to, um, Kind of accept that those emotions can be there and that, are, mm -hmm. that they are legitimate yeah uh, and that sometimes well i think i'm learning a lot from my students too <laughs> yeah. i think they are learning a bit in, the, in the, the classes not only from me but from from their colleagues and you know there's what we want to do and then there's what we really achieve and mm -hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if they would call me on it. It hasn't happened, right? But mm -hmm. um, I've I've learned from them in different ways, like in, in different uh, you know new new concepts that I hadn't uh, 
heard about like this happen in, in my course on the posts on the forum like like people were so informed on different topics that I this uh, this yes uh, and from the diversity that we were uh, talking about in our classrooms I do learn a lot but for now like I haven't received any comments on on stuff I've been saying in class but mm -hmm. I've always welcomed it so I, I'm thinking it might happen at a point right but the mm -hmm. the the power differential is still there or perceived yeah. so I it doesn't mean that I'm not saying things that might be problematic right it's mm -hmm. it's just saying like maybe they don't feel comfortable enough right now to call yeah. me on it so I'm trying to make the space as um, as open to this as as it's possible, and to say like you, you don't have to call me on it like in, in front of everyone. You can do it privately, or mm -hmm. but I understand. You know that I'm still the one putting the marks. Like if you're a student, how much? What's your leverage there? How, what do you perceive? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, when it's not something that is done um, in other courses, then might yeah. be like, why? Why would she uh, let us do this? And if I do this in another class, and it 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 brought it, it, I did this in another class for for another professor, and it brought me bad things. I'm not gonna try doing this. Yeah. Uh, here. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think it's like it acknowledges that like there's so much ingrained beliefs and understandings about you know what education is like what teaching and the power dynamic is um, and I think what you're doing provides that like maybe first step in challenging those you know yeah. deeply held beliefs about the you know, oh, I can't confront my teacher because, you know, it'll backfire or, um, but it's in us being vulnerable and opening up and openly and explicitly trying to create that space. I think it is one of those first steps that, you know, even if they're not coming to us and challenging what we're saying that maybe, you know, they're, they do feel more open in just talking in the course um to maybe each other or um i think it, it just reinforces that this is a space of learning right and yeah. that learning is more than just the content that we're <laughs> exploring and i think maybe the if it if it it is it changing i think it is changing socially mm -hmm. so if it changes outside of the classroom uh just what we've seen in the in the last few weeks following uh, the Floyd murder, but mm -hmm. you know other movements like the Me Too movement changed changed a lot of things concerning yeah. sexual harassment in, in the, uh, on the campus. So you know there's things changing that might help bring this in the classroom or making it you know uh, more generalized uh, and not be the exception, but. Yeah. Oh, I think I was reading the other day that, um, you know, you can't have social emotional learning without, you know, an anti-racist perspective, because that's part, like, if we're looking at kind of Castle, so it's the American large group that does the research on, on social emotional learning, like the social awareness, perspective taking, and like deeply analyzing you know, our surroundings and reflecting and all that stuff, you can't have that without challenging and thinking about, you know, what is happening around us. And I think, yeah. you know, those movements like Me Too and the Black Lives Matter, you know, Black Lives Matter isn't new, but there's been so much, um, you know, within the last little bit that has happened that it's really brought it to the forefront um, of everybody's mind. And I think that's, um, you know, just reinforcing that conversation that, you know, even outside of school, these social yeah. emotional competencies and reflecting and communicating and thinking about what's happening 
um, around us is just so critical. Um, and then bringing that back to the classroom is providing that space to how do we go about thinking critically and um, having these discussions in a respectful and um, you know aware way of taking in other perspectives and you know it's not jumping on people if you think that they're wrong it's you know listening and trying to understand where they're coming from and you know that broader picture and stuff um so that's that's fantastic <laughs> like think about like you know the the role that so social emotional learning can play in analyzing what's happening around us like these yeah. big massive things that are happening around us um as you know kind of the drapes are being pulled back and everything so yeah i think, I think that's i think it also brings one important question, and I've, I've had it more specifically in history education, because often, like even in, in curriculums, uh, there's one of the critical skills, uh, which is perspective. But it's perspectives yeah. with an S, like, but it, it is often understood as, I'm going to sh show you the two sides. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, for me, I'm trying to fight this because this often ignores social emotion. <laughs> like that, it ignores power differentials. In, mm -hmm. in, like if there's an event and you just show the white supremacist as, as an equivalent option to anti-racism. Mm -hmm. it, 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 <laughs> it, it's, it's just not two equal perspectives. And if yeah. as teachers, we show this as being equal then we I think we reinforce the perspective that already has um, too much media exposure yeah yeah <laughs> that, too much power already in, in, mm -hmm. in society or that uh, threatens some some groups uh, or individuals um, so yeah, it's a difficult question because every time I, I bring it up, or I think maybe the way sometimes we frame some some topics as being controversies, that might be problematic. But that's also a thinking that I'm I'm having. If I'm thinking, if I'm saying that that uh, when we talk about gender, we bring up controversies, then if I open up the door to say that it's a controversy, I'm opening up the door the to some opinions mm -hmm. that are based on facts and that are threatening, right? So, um, and in history, well, you bring in a, a new layer, right? Because you're talking about things that happened in the past where you're supposed to take a critical distance, but mm -hmm. we wouldn't be interested about the past if we were not thinking about the present. So mm -hmm. uh, we can't completely take a distance. And so that's mm -hmm. also, um, um, and all of this, well, you mix this up with all those identities and, and, and uh, well, you have a lot of emotion <laughs> out there. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that the, the notion of controversy is, is maybe controversial. <laughs> maybe, um, yeah I, yeah it's something i've been thinking about like how do i frame some of those topics when i mm -hmm. uh when i bring them in um if if we talk about uh, uh, slaves during a history class um and you know there's always the 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 argument well you know at, at in this in, in an the, this other era well it was just normal you know it was the thing and it was just accepted mm -hmm. and, and it's just asking the question the you know by who mm -hmm. you think the slaves themselves thought this was the normal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's not it's it's i think it's making them realize also that the way even curriculums sometimes, but history narratives 
are written, and they're not neutral. Mm -hmm. They always, you know, the way it's formulated always has um, a perspective. And yes. Just who do you put as uh, the one doing the, the historical change, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've drifted to something else, but it's, that's okay. Uh, no, I think it really highlights like that critical um, thinking piece that like falls in the problem solving um, category. Um, so I'm just conscious of time. Yep. So um, I'll end on kind of what do you think are like the key practices or um, what is critical for the future of online teaching and learning? I think it's the, the main thing is that you always have to have a presence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm scared that for, uh, and we've seen this because of the recent context, um, a lot of people who say they don't have any problems with teaching online, well, if you, if you were teaching for three hours in front of an auditorium, uh, and you're teaching while well, you're uh, doing the same thing, it won't change the fact that they're there or they're, as, they're, they're passive, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, we have to find ways to engage students um, actively in online learning. Uh, but to have them engage means that I have to be present, <laughs> mm -hmm. that I have to, uh, for example, generally around the half semester, I will write an individual email just saying, okay, you know, you have like uh, four posts uh, already. Uh, you need to have two more posts. This is your average right now. This was your first assignment. So um, just, you know, remind them like where you are right now. That may be like the self-management, mm. but um, if you had and, and remind them that I know this is an online asynchronous, mm -hmm. but please feel free to, to, to write and ask for a meeting if, if at this point you, you feel like you need a little help or, uh, or you just want to talk or you just want to uh, anything. Just remind them that you are there. Um, mm -hmm. That's one thing. And yeah, and trying to think even when you have large larger classes how this can be active um, mm -hmm. not active in responding to an online quiz right but <laughs> well it depends on the kind of quiz there can be fun things too yeah um, but not just like these are the readings this is my video or even worse like these are the readings <laughs> these yeah. are the assignments have a good semester right yeah <laughs> Um, and from what I've heard from students, this happens, <laughs> but then is it teaching? Is it, is, there's like nothing pedagogical in that. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think the fight will be to, for me, it implies that we have a, a union and, and, and people defending our right to have small groups so that mm -hmm. I can have, I can build something with my students. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't know like the number, <laughs> exact number <laughs> yeah. where this, um, I can tell you where I start feeling like it's too much to handle. Mm -hmm. but, um, like over 20 online for me, for what I'm yeah. trying to do over 20 feels overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. yeah, I don't know if that responds to... Yeah, I think um, just that, you know, if we want our students to be engaged, we ourselves need to be engaged, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, like thinking through all those things that we've been talking about um, and, you know, finding ways to communicate that so that we can create that space. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know in terms of class size, like I have 35 right now. Yeah. And yeah, if I, I message, we have like formative feedback every two weeks. If I were doing that for the whole class every two weeks, like that's just yeah. 
you know, and I'm always open on office hours and, you know, sending messages otherwise. But um, so my TA and I kind of switch each one, but then like, you know, when I jump back into the, like when we flip back, I'm always just like, oh, I feel like I haven't talked to this person in forever. Yeah. Um, it's tough, but like, you know, that was the way we found kind of works at the moment, but it's... And I know there's like, there's ways you can have like, because generally when there's an assignment, for example, mm -hmm. and I do this like when I'm, I'm teaching uh, in, in, on the campus, right? I will mm -hmm. have like, read those assignments and identified like three or five elements that you know were problematic or were very good or were and I'll mm -hmm. have to do like this general feedback before I hand in the assignment just saying like well you know this happened this is this mm -hmm. if, if we go back how could we do this and and if, like in larger groups this is a possibility right instead of individual feedback uh, mm -hmm. but then we still lose that relationship, individual relationship. Yeah. Build. Uh, whether I'm on campus, will they still see me? They can still, uh, there's, there's something that. Yeah. Yeah. And we might get better at this, but <laughs> I hope we do. <laughs> but yeah, of, of, of making them understand that they should and they can ask, um, uh, for, 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 for a meeting, for, mm -hmm. so that they can have this, uh, the, I like the synchronous, um, but it's not always possible. Like we have students in, in, uh, Africa or in Europe. So mm -hmm. at the time, it, sometimes it's just, impossible like especially when mm -hmm. you have those classes in in graduate schools they're generally in the evening so yeah um i fought yeah. to get to have this this class um with synchronous meetings um and i did have half like half synchronous meetings have asynchronous mm -hmm. um, and it's the, in the asynchronous that i did a lot of differentiation like I had mm -hmm. this plan, like this is suggested and step one, two, three, four, five and extra steps for, for the people who felt like, or even like, even like the step one, if, well, if you already know all those definitions, you know, just <laughs> yeah. go to step two. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I think. And like now we're, we're, I won't get into this too much because of time, but yeah. um, I know the university has like thrown it around a little bit and like there's been lots of talk in the higher ed world um, about like flex uh, courses. So like they're almost, I don't want to say requiring, but hoping that we'll find ways to somehow manage teaching asynchronous for those that can, uh, yeah. synchronously those that want to choose that route and so like that's something I've been thinking about um and I'll, I'll probably put something together as maybe an accompaniment to this <laughs> to yeah. talk for the students and just trying to think through like how do we do that and um yeah so that will be interesting I've, I've read a couple articles um in I think the chronicle about ways that we might be able to do that but uh yeah it's it's an interesting way forward i think in in finding ways but then what does that require of us mm -hmm. it, as the and, educators you know for the fall like uh, uh, my husband at his university he gets the the choice to go teach uh, there but with respecting social distance yeah. right? and and so the students if they are in the classroom they they have to keep that two meters. <laughs> and so he said, well, I'm going to work on, on Zoom or Adobe workshops, and then they can mm -hmm. really talk to each other, and that will be more efficient in that case. But it's the, what, what lacks for me, uh, especially for history education, or, and that's going to be the same for science education, is, you know, uh, for elementary teachers, I have them working with Legos. <laughs> yeah. I do, like, um, I, I, I do um, 
timelines where they, they yeah. receive things and and they're there it's like a a live timeline i wouldn't know <laughs> but that can really only be done in person without yeah. social distanciation so there's still some stuff that we can't do online mm-hmm. but online brings other possibilities yeah so i'm uh yeah <laughs> yeah there's there's the good and the bad and the, yeah the what i'm learning and that i have to keep an open mind and trying to find ways but yeah it does mean yeah. a lot of of engagement on uh on the professor side and mm-hmm. when you're teaching it, uh, on campus you kind of i think you feel more directly like when it works or not Mm -hmm. Uh, online you sometimes receive emails oh this is great i'm having a lot of fun Uh, i'm learning a lot but it's not as direct right it's not the uh, especially if they don't open their camera you don't see the reactions yeah um yeah that's another emotional thing (laughs) uh, (laughs) how do you handle like not knowing if the if the mes- the message passes if, if what yeah. you need to do uh, yeah that's another yeah. struggle um, yeah for sure well I'll wrap it up there because I'm yeah. conscious of your time and um, so yeah merci encore um, merci it, was, <laughs> it was such a pleasure talking to you and uh, yeah I think um, this has been a really fruitful conversation. Um, and just thinking through, you know, all these social emotional skills and competencies and how they apply to, you know, teaching in higher ed. And then, you know, you were able to even trickle that down to, um, you know, in teaching and education, it's influencing our teacher candidates, right? And how they're going to be practicing. And um, so I thank you so much for that. I will. And end. thank you. You gave me ideas too. So <laughs> we'll, we'll continue this, this chat. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> at another point. Thanks for listening to the SEL in action podcast with Heather Woods. If you like the show and want to know more, check out SEL hyphen in hyphen action.com or leave us a review on iTunes. Be sure to follow SEL in action on Facebook and Twitter for updates on our podcast. I'll talk to you soon.